Good evening. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here tonight. We are closed to the public. We have no musicians or singers, regrettably. And so the Lord has something for us tonight, and I'm ready to roll. Let's do this. The text comes tonight from Romans 13. We'll read from verse 11 all the way through verse 14. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You and I have been invited to a great occasion, the feast of the Heavenly Father and the host of all heaven. But we have to get dressed for this occasion, so tonight I want to preach to you about dressed for the occasion. And the text comes out of our Bible reading that said, Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness And let us put on the armor of light. We have to get dressed for the occasion. Although there aren't a million people in the chapel tonight, there's no one here but you and I and some techies. And (laughs) they're back there. But I'm dressed for the occasion. This is the house of the Lord. I have on something suitable for the house of God. When you go to a big event, you should always dress for the occasion. If it is not a big event, then you should also dress for whatever occasion you're headed to. But tonight we have the promise of heaven, and our desire is to get there and to see the Lord. But we have to get dressed. He said here, that we have to put on the Lord Jesus. First, let's talk about dirty clothes. Getting saved is very much like changing clothes. God often in the Bible likens sin to dirty clothing. If he didn't liken it unto dirty clothing, then he usually called it nakedness. One such place is Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. He said, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. God wants us to purchase the real gold, not the fool's gold. To buy of him white raiment, that which is free of stains and free of dirt and filth, so that we might be clothed, as he says here, instead of thinking we are clothed and deceiving ourselves to think we have riches when really the filth and the riches of this world are no treasure at all. But he's telling us, take my advice. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me. That doesn't mean God's riches and blessings are for sale, but it means Jesus has something for all of us. He said, I would advise you to get what I have for you instead of what you think you have said that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see, as opposed to thinking we see. And he said, as many as I love, 
I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Talking about dirty clothes. Look at what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 16, the 15th verse. He said, Behold, I come as a thief, which means unexpectedly. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. All of this is a lesson in being prepared being dressed for the occasion because we're looking forward to the great event that God has planned for all of us who make it in. Amen. But notice he said, Behold, I come as a thief, unexpectedly. I'm reminded of a man that came to church years ago, and he, he had his vehicle painted, spray painted on the side of his vehicle. Now, you have to be really persuaded of something when you do graffiti on your own privately owned vehicle. And he painted on there, Jesus is coming in the year 2000. He came to church, he came up, gave me some papers that morning and said, I know that no man knows the hour or the day, but God has shown me that the Lord is coming in the year 2000. I just looked at him. I felt sorry for him, he took his papers, he went his way, and I thought, boy, is he mistaken. Well, he came back a year later, January 2001, and he said, the first thing he said when he looked at me and came across the foyer back there is, I know I made a mistake. I said, yes, you certainly did. He said, I made some errors, but I've been talking to God, and I got it straightened out. I miscalculated something. But this time, I was not so willing to let him slide. I said, sir, I don't really believe that, because if the Lord Jesus was returning today or this year, I would have already been gone seven years ago. But that doesn't matter. I told him what really matters is whether you believe the same things I believe or not. That isn't as critical as being ready. We need to be ready. And he agreed to that, but I never saw him again. Many people think that they know when it's going to happen. And in the world, there's so many voices out there in the news and it's so depressing and discouraging to listen to these people with their doomsday theories. And they think that the apocalypse is upon us and all these things are going to happen and the world's going to fall apart. But I'm not so persuaded. I still have faith in America. And I believe there are a lot of people out there that want it to be right if they had to go and overthrow all of these evil ones. I don't know what will happen, and I'm not professing to know what happens, but this I know. God will have his way, and it will get really ugly before the coming of the Lord for all the nations of the earth. And we really can't control that. But what we can do is remain dressed for the occasion. Be ready to go. Are you ready to meet the Lord today? That's what's really important. And if we say we're ready to go, then what if you do get the virus and die? What then? You'll be there, right? So, there's no other vehicle to get out of this world unless the rapture of the church takes place. If that happens, praise the Lord. If it doesn't happen, praise the Lord. And none of you out there, and I don't care what you say you know or what you think, none of you know when the coming of the Lord will be because he said as much. Again, in Revelation 3, verse 4, he spoke to this church in Sardis, Jesus personally sending them a message, and he said, you have some people there that have not defiled their garments. He was speaking, obviously, of sin, not really about their laundry. He said, they shall walk with me in white, 
for they are worthy. And finally, I give you one more while we're talking about dirty laundry. Jude 23 through 25. If you don't know the chapter, send me a text. And I'll tell you what chapter it is, the only one that it is. Jude. It's in Jude. Well, I wish I had a laugh track right now. It's the only way I can gauge whether something's funny or not. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Talking about dirty laundry. He said there in Jude, to pull people out of the fire, and in the process, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. When we're walking after the flesh or living for sin and for our bodies and for earthly pleasures, it is a stain on our spiritual garment. God wants us to be dressed for the occasion, which means keeping our spiritual laundry white and clean. So we need to, next of all, change our clothes. Who wears dirty clothes day after day if they can help it? Why, laundry is a part of everyone's life. <laughs> Amen, I hope. But many people never change their spiritual laundry or linen. And if the Christian does not keep his spiritual garments cleaned up, he will just get dirtier and dirtier, smellier and smellier. Take stuff off. When clothes are dirty, take them off. This is what we should do. But I'm talking about the spiritual clothing that God refers to when he speaks of stained, filthy garments. Take some stuff off, the text said. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Did you notice that it said cast off? It did not say gently remove those garments. It said throw it off violently. Get rid of it. Pull it off and throw it away. And then put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that is the armor of light. His clothing, spiritual laundry, is protective. It guards us and protects our hearts. Now there's a dirty laundry list there in Colossians chapter 3, and he tells us what to take off. He said in Colossians 3, 5 through 9, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What does that mean? Our members is not our church members. He does not recommend killing church members. He's talking about the members of your body, the deeds of what your body wants, your mortal flesh that lusts for the things that are not right. He said mortify it, not literally kill it, as we would think of slaughtering a hog, but he means to put it to death, make it dead, control it, tear it out by the roots, get rid of the power of that lust in our lives that makes us do unclean things. He said, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in the which you also walk sometime when you lived in them. But now you also put off all of these. Here's some more spiritual laundry that has to be taken off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. 
Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Now, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it said, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A creature is that which is created. You are in Christ a new creation. He said, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things be, are become new, and all things are of God. No longer are we the old man. That's what we used to call our dad back in the 70s, my old man. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the old you before you got saved. Because when you've been born again, there's a new you that's walking around. And he doesn't think the same and act the same, look or talk the same. He's a different man. He's created in Christ Jesus under good works. He was evil, but now he's good. He was filthy, but now he's clean. He's a different person, this man who's in Christ. And so he said, put off not just the old man, but also his deeds. Get rid of what he does. Quit doing that. The new you doesn't do that anymore. You're not a sinner anymore. Quit saying you are one. The less you say you are one, the less sin you'll commit. Amen. Program yourself for sin. You should be saying, I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. I'm more than a conqueror. I am not a debtor anymore to uh, obey sin. I don't have to yield to sin anymore. I'm a Christian with the power of God living in me. And if you don't have that, you should and you can. All you have to do is let him in and put on the armor of light and get rid of the dirty laundry. And Jesus will empower you to live a life of purity and true holiness. Put stuff on. He continued and said, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, not in drunkenness, not in chambering. You know, things that go on in the private chambers. Not in wantonness, that flagrant uh, lack of respect for all things decent. It's not in strife. Quit fighting. Quit envying people. Say, so get rid of all of those clothes and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. I've talked to so many people, and it's amazing how they actually make provision for the flesh. They provide what's needed to bring about the lusts that they have or the, uh, the receiving the object of the lust they have. They make it happen. We plan our own sin because when the desire rears up, we already know what we want and we go after it and do whatever's necessary, including making logical arguments with our own mind. This is what I want to do. And so this is why I'm going to do this. But it doesn't always go with what God, th God thinks or it doesn't agree with him. So lastly is Colossians 3.10. You have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The point is we have to get Jesus on the inside before we can have him working on the outside. And Jesus said it himself when he spoke about that cup. In Matthew 23, he looked at the religious hypocrites of that day in their, all their self-righteousness and the way that they were judging everybody by everything they did. They were right there to condemn them for not washing their hands. And you should wash your hands. We're in the middle of a, you know what, they're telling us wash our hands. But to them, you didn't wash your hands before you ate. You were committing a sin, which was not true. And Jesus looked at them and said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, 
cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Kind of reminds me of going to Denny's one night. I took a big drink out of a cup of coffee that they had just brought. And I looked down, there was a big red lipstick print right where I drank from. I almost threw up, but that was the outside of the cup. So if that wasn't clean, you know the inside wasn't clean. Same is true as what Jesus said here. If, if you look on the outside of a man and he's full of wickedness and all kinds of deeds that are not right, then you know he's not right inside. Because when we get right inside, then we automatically are clean on the outside. Because the works that we do may not save us. They don't. But our faith is just a mere profession if our outward actions don't back up the faith we say we have. Christ is the clothing that we need to put on. So the final question is, how do I put on Christ? How do I do this? Well, it isn't as many people may think. I want you to look with me at Galatians 3, 26, 27 real quickly. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. If you don't have faith in Christ, you're not a child of God, by the way. But thank God he has many children. You become a child of God today. That's what you should do. You can be born again into the family that is awesome. That is the child or the, the family of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And he said, for as many of you, it's like saying, because as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This would lead someone to believe that if they've been baptized in water, they're clothed with Christ. But that is not true. All these scriptures I gave you tonight show that uh, putting on Christ is a conscience conscious decision that we make because we reckon the old man to be dead and we're dead to sin because the old us is dead and now we're alive unto God and God lives in us because we've been born again and water did not achieve that this he said you're baptized into Christ is about baptism into the body of Christ it's not about water. So it uh, really calls for us to bring in this, yes, I promise this time, the last verse. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free. We have all been made to drink into one spirit. The baptizer here is God's Spirit, capital S, the Holy Ghost. And the one being baptized are the believers who have been placed by him into the body of Christ. And this is what he was talking about in that previous verse. That he said, let me read it again for you. Let's go back a second. Galatians 3, 26, 27. As many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This is how you get into the body. But this is not how you assume the deeds of the believer. Once you're saved, yes, you'll instantly change and automatically begin doing things differently because the inward you has now been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you're born again now. But as you go along and you look forward to the occasion for which we're all headed, you decide from day to day, I'm not going to take back upon me the deeds of darkness. I'm going to put on Christ. I'm going to wear the armor of light. And it's almost as daily as changing your physical clothing. I have to decide to choose what is right. I have to decide.
to live what is, in a way that's pleasing to God and decide to shun evil, to eschew evil, Peter said in his epistle. Eschew it, push it away, chase it away, and cleave to that which is right. Cling to it, love it, embrace it, because that's the only way that we're going to make it to that heavenly occasion. To hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of thy Lord. Amen. So we're going to stop right there today. But we've been preaching to you about being dressed for the occasion. The occasion is the great heavenly eternal feast that God has invited all people to. But only those who believe will enter into it. And we talked about the dirty clothes and what dirty spiritual clothing is. And I gave you many verses out of Revelation and Jude about how God thinks of sin as dirty clothing. And that we should hate the garment spotted by the flesh. And then change our clothes. If we find that there's spots and soiling upon our spiritual clothing, we must change clothes. Cast off the works of darkness and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in the daylight instead of the darkness. Put on the new man, he said in Colossians. Clean the inside of the cup first, Jesus said. And though we're in the body, placed there by the Spirit, we still must make these decisions. I want to make it into heaven. And therefore, I'm going to stay dressed for the occasion because I know not the day, I know not the hour, but I must keep myself ready. And if you aren't ready tonight, and you've, you're listening to me preach, and you've felt and you know God has shown you you're not ready, then what you should do is get ready. Why postpone preparation? Especially when you don't know the day or the hour of the coming of the Lord. And even more importantly, you might leave this world long before the coming of the Lord Jesus. That is what you need to worry about, whether you see him at his coming or you see him beforehand. And get your heart ready, trim your lamps, keep them burning, and be watching and waiting for the blessed coming of the Lord. Thank you for joining us tonight, and God bless you is my earnest prayer. And we conclude right here this solo service tonight. Father, I thank you for each one that's listening. I pray that you bless them and inspire them, Lord, to be ready, prepared at all times. For we don't know when any of it is going to happen. And so in your word, you constantly warned that we keep things right, keep things ready so that we're not taken by surprise. And I thank you for each one that listened, and I pray that you do a work in every life according to their faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for the support that's been coming in, and all of you who support the work of the Lord. Remember, you can go to myntcc.org and give a direct offering there if you want to to any one of our churches if you want to support our churches overseas whether it's Korea, Okinawa Germany, Philippines you can give direct on their websites but we also send support to them from World Missions each month and um, you can give directly to World Missions using the Mobile Mission app Mobile Mission, that's singular, Mission, not Missions. Mobile Mission is our uh, NTCC app that you can use to give to World Missions. 
and all of the world missions is used to support works overseas. We also have a missionary in Panama. And all of its use for that, that's 100% of your dollars go for the support of those works. And I also have a website coming soon where I'll be putting up preaching, audio sermons, also some legacy sermons from preachers in the past, some sermons from Pastor Davis. For those of you that know him and knew him, he's been gone now about four years. Uh, actually, I think he's been six. Put up some of his sermons that we have captured from old reel to reels, and uh, they're pretty awesome. That's my website, preachtome.com. That's preach, and the number two, me. Preach to me dot com. Go in there, subscribe to that, and when I launch the site, which will be very soon, you'll get a notification that some sermons have been put up there. I'll also be launching a podcast very soon with teachings about various Bible topics of all kinds. And uh, also... You can go to myntcc.org, and there's links there to lead you to many other great things. So God bless you. Share, share, share. Invite, invite, invite. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click the bell. The little bell icon means that you want to be notified every time something new is put up on the site. Share, 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 invite, invite, send it to your family, send it to your friends, send it to people in foreign countries. Let's get the word out about Jesus Christ and his wonderful salvation. God bless all of you. Thank you.